I think it's remarkable that the Great War has such powerful echoes today and uh, for Australians it, it really shaped the nation that we, we live in, the, the tragedy of Federation, I can say that as a Western Australian, I hope that we'll get our freedom inside my my, uh, my lifetime, but uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the tragedy of Federation was only 14 years old when, when Australia went to war. Uh, at that time we promised the Empire, our, our, our Prime Minister-elect promised, uh, promised the, the Britain that we would support Britain to the last man and the last shilling, and we offered an expeditionary force of 20,000 soldiers. By 1919 we had 60,000 dead, a population of less than 5 million Australians sent an expeditionary force and maintained it, an all-volunteer force of 330,000 soldiers. Initially, the Australian Imperial Force, our overseas army, fought on Gallipoli through 1915, a disastrous campaign that the survivors were extracted from and back to Egypt, and they weren't sure how they'd be received. What they discovered was that their gallantry had inspired the nation and they came back to a huge force of reinforcements from one and a half divisions of, of you know, 15,000 soldiers each. We were able to field a, 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 a force on the Western Front of five divisions, a massive force. It wasn't until 1918 that this, this group of Australians formed their own army, their own corps under uh, General Lam Monash, a Victorian. But what it meant was that they were suddenly at the centre of this extraordinary war, this war that, that changed the nature of world history. In 1916, Australians became part of the British Expeditionary Force on the Somme, a battle that had begun with 60,000 casualties and continued right through to the, um, the, the winter of 1916-17. The war started again in 1917 and the first action by the Australians was at Bonacor where they found the German defences, the, the defences the defenses to which the Germans had retired uh, and the Australians were to lodge a feint at Bonacor while the British attacked at Arras. The only successful part of that offensive was the Australian penetration of the Hindenburg Line at Bullecourt, and Luke Skaberis has painted this extraordinary work on the far wall of depictions of the first battle of Bullecourt and the German bullets bouncing off the wire as the Australians are, are uh, fighting their way into the Hindenburg Line. Meanwhile, further north, New, Zealand, New Zealanders have dug tunnels that the British used in the battles of Arras, and, uh, and here we've got uh, um, Ewan MacLeod's paintings of imagining the British soldiers emerging from those steps underneath the uh, no man's land and emerging in front of the German wire. In 1917, however, after the failure at Arras, all of the effort moved north into Belgium, into the Ypres salient, and that gave this exhibition its name. From late June of 1917 until the end of that year, Australians fought as part of the British forces in the Ypres salient, some 38,000 Australians were killed or critically injured in the salient. It became the byword for horror on the Western Front, the battles for Passchendaele. And if you have a look at the uh, um, Ross Laurie's work in the, uh, in the distance, we can see that the war was entering a new phase um, and, the, and the battles of Passchendaele were fought in the mud. The Germans owned the high ground and they took shelter inside blockhouses. And I think that there's some, it's a very haunting image of those blockhouses, so solid that a hundred years later, they still remain dotting that battlefield. The battles of Passchendaele failed. The breakthrough that they'd hoped for was, for, was, uh, was thwarted by the change in the weather. Uh, and the entire army bogged down in the mud, mud so thick that it swallowed the dead and the dying. Uh, eight, less than 20% of those who died in the, uh, in the salient have known graves because the landscape swallowed them. And so this, this depiction of landscape is a constant uh, reminder of why it's important for us to visit that ground. In 1918, the war changes. It becomes a, a mobile war 
and the Germans launch a huge assault, their last chance to change uh, their, their fate uh, as the, the defeated army on the Western Front. And they sweep down the Somme Valley, uh, and I think Amanda's done a remarkable job capturing the ground over which Operation Michael, the, great, the last chance the Germans had to win the war after they got a spare army because of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia and before the Americans arrived on the Western Front. All they needed to do was to get to Amiens and they got to within 11 mile and the Australians stopped them at Villa Bretonneau. They stopped them and the battles were fought <coughs> on the ground depicted in that, that, uh, that wonderful landscape. Then it was up to the Australians and the Canadians to lead the counterattack back uh, that drove the Germans, defeated the German army in the field, defeated the German army, and they had seen how much this destruction uh, could, could, dis could, could just devastate a landscape. They didn't want that to happen at home, and so on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, their army sued for peace. And uh, it, it, uh, tragically, it set the scene for another world war. But this exhibition is a fascinating journey into those battlefields of the First World War. Battlefields, as I mentioned, that, uh, uh, that, that is still the last resting place of so many Australians. And um, uh, half of them lie in unknown graves beneath these foreign fields. So uh, uh, I think it's probably best to hand over to the artists who walk this ground and put their own impressions down of the, uh, the countryside they encounter.